So my name is Roger, and um, I run a YouTube channel called Punish Felix, which I made because, um, because <laughs> sorry for laughing. I think it's funny, but um, yeah, I, it's good. good. I, I um, <clears throat> so basically, what happened to me was um, I got exposed to this stuff in 2020 when I started to kind of you know lose control of my life, starting to have issues and stuff and it really spoke to me and it really um it really changed my life in a lot of ways I wasn't expecting and I think it's like um I'm kind of like a funny guy you know I I think things are really funny all the time and stuff so to me it was um <clears throat> I I started it off as kind of like a joke channel right but then I started to learn more and I started mm -hmm. to take things more seriously and that's how I kind of got here right I guess as a little bit of an introduction to myself and so um this is the first time i've ever done anything like this so i'm kind of just trying to figure everything out as i go along i'm gonna um gonna work and edit this along once i complete it mm -hmm. fix things up Whew. so um okay yeah so how about we just start off i'm uh you know the the when I first, uh, I don't, I don't remember what led me your way exactly. I, I have a friend in the server who often tells me I should go and email random people. And, mm -hmm. uh, that's probably how it ended up, honestly. And, um, I started to notice once I, uh, once we started to set up this interview, I started to notice you know, hey, you're popping up here, you're popping up there. I noticed that you were involved in the translation and editing of uh, Bifo's book about... Uh, it, it's Guattari, right? I'm right, uh-huh. Okay, good. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, I'm pronouncing it properly. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I started to notice you kind of popping up everywhere, and I was just kind of like... I'm just kind of like curious, like an introduction, like where... How did you get involved in this? How did you get started? Like, what, what's your story? Okay. Well, my name is Charles Duvall, um, and I have, I'm retired from academia. Um, I was a professor in French studies, and from, I guess I got my first job in 1980, but I was a graduate teaching assistant for five years before that, so... If we start from 75, we're talking almost 50 years ago. And um, it was while I was a graduate teaching assistant um, at the uh, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana that I started, um, well, it was just trying to put together an understanding of all the crazy stuff that had gone on um, really from the end of World War II up to that time in terms of French thought. That's that's so uh, that's it's not that sounds grandiose, but that's basically what it was. And um, I can say that now in retrospect. At the time, I couldn't figure that out for the life of me. But um, the big ism that was in, that was looming at that point um, was structuralism. And um, even though structuralism sounds like an odd thing nowadays to um, find um, exciting or even interesting, um, that's where things were at in the mid-1970s uh, because um, there was something that I could call a translation gap. Um, yeah, that, there's like a catch-up. Yeah, there's a huge catch-up culturally. And so basically what I eventually was able to piece together, and again, not in those years while I was a graduate student, but shortly thereafter, I think, um, was that while everyone was trying to figure out, so the import of the work of Claude Lévi-Strauss, um, the early role on BARP, um, the sort of linguistic term that things took in structural structuralism, the importance of linguistics for structuralism and different kinds of linguistics for structuralism. So I'm talking here, so mid-late 50s into the mid-1960s. Gradually, towards the end of the 1960s in France, things started giving way 
to what would become what we would call on our side of the ocean post-structuralism. But um, that really that really had has no significance for the French. And it's just that thought was developing, trans was moving on. And so you suddenly had thinkers um, like Derrida, um, Althusser, and, um, and of course, Deleuze and Guattari, who were thinking in their own way and moving basically beyond the sort of structuralist confines, um, which is what one can be really, I mean, I, I was very engaged with structuralism because it was something you could really, you know, lock down and utilize, um, as it were, as a, as a method. But then, you know, it quickly you can point out that, yeah, but I mean, how far does that take you if you're just, if you're in some ways applying a formula over and over again mm -hmm. um, to say to literary studies, just to, to put that what I was interested in. And um, so anyhow, so, so I'm reading all this stuff in the late 1970s, but in terms of the stuff I was reading, um, 1960, I mean, I, I came upon an article while I was doing my research um, frankly, on it was on Stendhal, um, and um, it was an article by a guy named Michel Piersens who had written an article on Stendhal's The Red and the Black. He'd done an analysis of it that seemed to be a structural uh, structuralist type analysis, but in fact, he brought in um, references to difference in repetition and to logic of sense by Deleuze, and what those were doing there. Um, I couldn't figure out at the time. I mean, I, it was hard enough for me to just sort of make, I mean, it wasn't a, like I was having enough trouble just dealing with his own analysis and see how he put that things together. Uh, and then to have these sort of what I could call these two jokers in the pack or this joker in the pack to come popping up as two different books. I became really intrigued by what he had to say, the, the, the quotes that um, Michel Piancens chose from Deleuze, uh, and, and in particular, and um, really what he was uh, dealing with, I, I just became, you know, curious, and so I started looking up the the books that were available, and the really the difference in repetition was only in French, and um, uh, logic of sense was only in French, and uh, and although i had pretty good french reading skills making sense of those uh were it was a really tough road to hoe and then um the book that did come out however in translation was anti-oedipus and so that's where i started off and um i had some friends at champaign urbana uh university of illinois who were also interested in reading it in translation and these guys were in um what would come to be known as cultural studies uh, cultural studies yeah larry larry grossberg was a professor there um, and uh, we were several of us were working together with him. So a number of graduate students and Larry were first we started reading. Actually, our, we started our reading group together with uh, some readings from Lacan's Écrit in translation. And then the second semester, we worked on Deleuze and Guattari's Anti-Oedipus, tried to work our way through that. And then the third semester together, we worked on some some texts by Foucault. Um, but trying to make sense of what all these different writers were dealing with and how one had one should distinguish each each of them from each other and and meanwhile i was working on roland Barthes for my own my own research um in in french studies so they got all these sort of key figures another key figure actually at that time was a guy named gerard Jeannette, who um whose work uh, became a basis for narratology so narratological studies, Roland Barthes, um, Deleuze, Guattari. Um, we had teachers also who were, we were reading Derrida. Um, we we're reading some Foucault, Lacan. I mean, all these different names. What, the, what is this gumbo? You know, this French gumbo of <laughs> names, you know, sort of sorting all this out. I mean, it was really, it was this weird period where, the texts that you were becoming available in translation were the ones that you were reading, but it wasn't like you were be being given them in any kind of chronological order, a systematic order with, you know, with a cultural guidebook of how they fit kinda, in relationship to each other. It kind of reminds me of how, like, a lot of the um, s random stuff that's in soft subversions is just stuff that's taken out of schizoanalytic cartographies. That was really surprising for me to learn, actually. I was like, wait, it's the same thing. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, I, I, I have those books wait. I'm at two floors down in the basement, um, but I'd have to run down and get them to refer to them. But um, yeah, you're right. I mean, and, and the thing that makes that crazy, uh, just to take that as a reference point for, for Guattari, um, there was a first edition done in semiotext of um, soft subversions and chaosophy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then um, after, um, I think this is why the, this, the second edition of these came out, um, because um, uh, Cyril Otranger and um, Semiotex came into, uh, I don't know what the, what the word is, I'll say partnership um, um, with um, MIT Press. And so, you know, so there was Semiotex um, doing the editing and a MIT Press was doing the distribution. Uh, I think there was that made it timely to take those earlier editions, um, recast them so that reorder the essays uh, so that because because if you look at the I believe if you look at the table of conference of the uh, co co uh, contents of the first chaosophy and then the second chaosophy they're not the same and the same is true of soft subversions. Um, so you know, uh, but they put them out. I wrote the introduction for the soft subversions. Uh, uh, edition, and it was, I just I remember it was distinctly different. But yeah, they're all recasting different essays that came out, um, and some of them were taken out of also Aguattari's um, The Winter Years, you know, Les Années d'Hiver. But that's a book that in itself has never been uh, edited it completely. So some of the essays have appeared, but but not the entire set of essays. Um, presumably because many of the essays are so specific to the French context that they, and also to a, a time and space in the French context of the mid, early, mid 1980s, that for, you know, most readers outside of France, um, nowadays, they wouldn't have that much um, import uh, or relevance. But in any case, um, yeah, there's, there's that kind of weird thing that was going on with, with the Guattari text. He's, he's a, his, the, you know, the history of Guattari translation is, is a whole separate story. But if you think of how Francois Duss uh, put together his book um, on Deleuze and Guattari, The Intersecting Lives, mm -hmm. um, you, it's, it's, it's the kind of cultural history uh, that one needed, I needed at that time, to make sense of what I was reading, you know, um, you know, if I could have jumped forward, uh, you know, 30 years to Francois Duss's book, you know, read a few pages and said, okay, now I'm going to jump back to the 1970s. You know, I could made that time, time portal type of thing, uh, between a text that could actually explain what I'm reading, you know, it might, it would, it would have really been helpful. Um, and there's a two volume edition on structuralism, the history of structuralism. I'm blanking on the name of, 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 the, of the author, but in any case, it's, it's sort of a masterful overview of all of these thinkers, you know, from from post world, the end of World War Two and probably pre World War Two, just to get the because it didn't come out of nowhere. Um, but in any case, situating how structuralism came into its own and all the different names that are connected with structuralism um, and then how it sort of bled into what came to be known as post structuralism. So there is a whole just this whole set of translations coming out. And so that's where I began was with uh, um, anti Oedipus and as I was ending my graduate studies at Champaign-Urbana, not having mastered an understanding of anti-Oedipus by any stretch of the imagination, um, I did put together an article um, that it came out in 1981 in Substance, a little journal from the University of Wisconsin. And it was a sort of, in my own feeble way, an introduction to um, anti-Oedipus. Um, and, uh, and then it appeared in a different sort of built up a little bit more in my, my first book on Deleuze and Guattari. Um, but uh, just as I was you know, sort of finishing my graduate studies and at the end of in 1980, what should pop out but um, Mille Plateau in France? And a friend of mine who thought my interest, a French friend of mine who thought my interest in Deleuze and Guattari was quirky, uh, sad but quirky. Um, 
he he bought me a copy of my, uh, Mil Plateau. I've still got that. That's the copy, I, I, a French copy I use with an um, with an inscription that says something like this: "These guys aren't the answer." Love Serge, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, like you know, you, you like you said, you said, Rube, no, you, these guys are taking you for a ride. Um, That's you so know, funny. And you know. You know, and if if anti Oedipus was was strange, believe me, um, Mill Plateau was was just out and out trip um, to try to figure out what was going on there. So you know, uh, basically, uh, my Deleuze and Guattari story has been um, really one of sort of uh, continuing cluelessness and trying to um, at least get. Uh, get the cluelessness uh, behind me, um, or at least to the extent that I could feel confident about some aspects and the other stuff that I don't get. Well, you know, maybe time will uh, help me with that. And if not, oh, well, uh, it, it's been fun. So yeah, so that's sort of where, where I'm coming from. <laughs> with, uh, it seems like it seems like a lot of people are in the same boat, honestly. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, um, each of the each of the texts that um, Deleuze or Deleuze and Guattari uh, present, or Guattari alone, um, you know, has their challenges. And, um, you know, you can get, uh, feel comfortable, at least on a particular day, uh, with a certain section of a certain book, and then um, other sections of that book might just sort of be a little bit more slippery. And uh, you're sort of still, yeah, I haven't quite, you know, haven't quite got that, you know. I mean, I can say that the the chapter in Mill Plateau of of the geology of morals, uh, you know, that's one that I just uh, still sort of shy away from. It's the it's the least my least not favorite chapter, but it's the least the one I've least I spent the least amount of time in, and yet gradually I, I'm beginning to see now through various things that I'm reading um, that Deleuze did in the seminars, beginning to see well yeah you know I'm kind of getting a feeling for for what that was about. The funny thing is, uh, if, if you uh, just go to the work that we're doing on the Deleuze seminars um, at Purdue, you know, the, the website that we've developed for the for um, presenting translations and the transcriptions of Deleuze's courses, the um, 1970s uh, section um, is not based on actual recordings to which we have access. We, we don't have access to any recordings until the recordings of uh, the begin in 1979. And um, so anything that's anything that we have on the site that's um, prior to 1979 are, are various transcripts that have, if you will, come down to us through the ages. Um, Mainly from uh, the the guy who developed uh, the site Web Deleuze, name his name is Richard Pinhas, and he's pretty much responsible for what we have prior to 1979. And the um, the material, if, if you think about uh, you think about that, Anti Oedipus came out in 1972, in say spring of 1972. Um, Deleuze started teaching his 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 stuff his seminars that were focused from 1970 or 71 all the way to 1980 were focused on the stuff that would appear in first in a thousand in in uh, anti Oedipus and then subsequently in a thousand plateaus and in fact he was working on the thousand plateaus. For, for most of that time, because Anti Oedipus came out in 1972, which was the second year of his seminars at, uh, at Vincennes. And so everything else was subsequently the chapters. And he tried in, in you know, in a systematic way, he tried to, to, to follow these through as they would, as he and, and Guattari sort of had figured out that they were going to be presenting them in a thousand plateaus. Well, some of those years, some of those seminars have significant gaps in them. So, for example, the stuff that appears uh, um, in Rhizome, the, the introduction, that came out as a separate book out of Deleuze and Guattari, but it was their introduction. 
But those opening chapters there, for some reason, particularly the geology of morals, there's very little uh, that I can find, if you will, in the seminars directly. And the stuff that's in, you will, the chapters that come after, like the linguistics, the two different linguistics, the linguistics and semiotics chapter, the chapter on faciality, um, on making yourself a body without organs. Some of that gets much more attention because we happen to have one set of records, uh, particularly the 75, 76 um, documents that are available, both as video as well as as uh, as tra written transcript and, and translation. That sort of central 1975, 76 encompasses quite a bit from sort of those chapters, those plateaus, I think, four, five and six and seven. Um, and then there's another gap of several years during up until you get to 1979. And 1979 is Deleuze working out the end of the book. Um, those those chapters on um, on the uh, micropolitics, um, on smooth and striated space, um, on apparatus of capture, and so forth. Those 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 major um, um, plateaus and he refers back to what they'd been doing in the previous year. So it's clear that that was working out those final plateaus was a two year, at least a two year project, if not more. So there, there are there are spots that we have reference points in the in the in the um, um, seminars that we can sort of say, OK, this is what he's talking about here. Some of this really resembles a thousand uh, that still re re resembles anti Oedipus, but it looks like now this is sort of a shift into shifting towards the stuff they're going to be talking about in a thousand plateaus. Then there's a couple years of gap. Then there's this big spike of uh, the videos from the French, excuse me, Italian television that we have on there, uh, which is uh, 1975, 76, big spike there. And the stuff I was mentioning before uh, from those uh, sort of plateau three, four, five, and six, if you will. And then, um, um, and then there's more gap. And then there's the big final spike before he leaves a uh, uh, thousand plateaus behind because it comes out um, it's published in, I think, spring uh, of 1980. So, you know, the, the, the stuff that's available and the stuff you can refer to, um, you know, just as there was a, the translation gap created its own issues, just putting together all the stuff on structuralism and post-structuralism. And in terms of Guattari and Deleuze and Guattari, trying to figure out where their, um, you know, what, what, how their thinking unfolded, um, you know, that that's kind of difficult in terms of at least in terms of the little seminars in terms of Guattari's great little uh, anti Oedipus papers, you know, his diary. Those, are, um, those and, are super valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there you can see that since they start uh, in 1970, you can see from the content in there. Like I wrote this in a, in a, 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 a essay I'm trying to get published. Um that the, the 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 book is mistitled. It shouldn't be the anti Oedipus papers. It should be the capitalism and schizophrenia papers, because he has his the stuff that he is telling telling Deleuze starting in the summer of 1969 when they began working together. The stuff that's coming out of Guattari's mouth in terms of his ideas and so forth, and then he notes down throughout this. This is stuff that most of the stuff they can't use in anti Oedipus. And it's stuff for later, and they just, and and Deleuze knew this, and he had to basically make decisions. Deleuze and Guattari had to make decisions on a structure for uh, the book that they were writing. And I have to believe that they got. That. I mean, I could probably find. Um, I, I think I have some details. Uh, there are some details within either Guattari's um, notes uh, in in the Antiochus papers or some of De, uh, Deleuze's uh, correspondence from the same time that really indicates that early on they knew that they were going to be having a four chapter book um, and you know they were really already early on I mean when I, mean, I say early on I'm talking into early 1970 they already had this structure uh, of what they were they were doing I mean they hadn't met before uh, April of 1969 so they worked like demons 
Um, even with even and you take into consideration that Deleuze was throughout this entire year of sixty nine and into seventy, he was recuperating from some serious um, oh, yeah. surgery. Um, so th despite that, I mean, in, in some ways, Guattari brought Deleuze back to life um, with this brand new type of project and brand new way of thinking and brand new way of working. And they began working together seriously, both in person, but then with this curious uh, process of Guattari writing down all these notes, shipping them over to Deleuze, um, Deleuze processing them, writing comments back. Um, and this back and forth between them uh, in in writing, you know, and, and we're not talking, you know, in this period of time, we're not talking exchanging thumb drives. I mean, we're we're, we're talking actual, you know, handwritten stuff um, or typewritten stuff, depending on you know the, the particular day. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah. So they had an early understanding of what uh, uh, they were going to be doing, and so a lot of the stuff that you read in the Antigonus papers is stuff that say, "Yeah, well, this will put aside for later." You know, so we're not going to be talking about faciality uh, per se uh, in um, Antigonus. We're not going to be uh, talking about uh, bird songs, uh, retournelles in Antigonus. Um, and these are things, these are concepts that Guattari is raising as early, I think as early as 70 or into 71. If you read through, you'll see, you know, there's just this a profusion of, um, of ideas that Guattari just, you know, was unleashed, as it were, to this sort of, Captain. you know, cap he, he gave him a discipline. He, he, yeah. he forced him into a discipline. That he didn't, Guattari didn't have. I mean, Guattari's first letter to Deleuze is is one in which he's Guattari's, you know, co complaining, whining about the fact that he can't settle himself down to um, prepare his first book. And this is where Deleuze steps in, and then in, in the we have that letter where Deleuze basically says, you know, here are your choices. You know, basically the choice was to not do it for several reasons that were lame as hell, or just do it. And if you're just going to do it, then to sit yourself down and give yourself a discipline. And then Deleuze basically laid a disciplinary schedule out to Guattari to sit down and write um, it, it, from early in the day as possible, and both for Deleuze but for himself. So Guattari's book, um, um, Psychoanalysis and Transversality, came out almost simultaneously uh, with um, anti Oedipus in 72. So it still took Guattari a while from the time they met in 69 to the publication to actually get that book out. But he did. And those were all, uh, you know, that's that first collection of his essays from the 1960s, uh, and including, I believe, uh, Machine and Structure, which was the mm -hmm. essay that really captured Deleuze's imagination in terms of the work that he wanted to be doing. And Deleuze wrote the introduction to um, uh, psychoanalysis and transversality. Um, I think it was, all, I thought it was three group problems. I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, in any case, so, you know, they're, they're coming together, um, sort of gave Guattari the, you know, the impetus to start, you know, just I got all these ideas and let me just get them out there. And he started doing that and Deleuze, he was the uh, editor, as it were, you know, the composer. Um, he had all these notes, so to speak, you know, this 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 just blast of notes, and then he had to bring them together in a particular way, and you know, and rein them in. And and some of the you 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 read in the Antiochus papers, some of Guattari's diary, um, like around the time of of Antiochus's um, publication in seventy two. Where after a couple of years of this um, discipline, um, he's kind of chafing at the bit, uh, and uh, not only chafing at the bit in terms of, if you will, the regime that he was in under with Deleuze, but also having then seen the product, um, knowing what what Deleuze had selected, and feeling himself Guattari to sort of have lost his his own. Um, voice in a lot of ways. I have to, I'd have to track I down I, that. I think particular... I know what quote you're talking about. Isn't that the one where he's talking about where he doesn't know like what's going to be cut, what's going to be uh, in the final like cut? Do you know what I'm talking about? 
Right. Yeah. Um, um, I don't have the book see. with He's, me right now. So. Yeah, I, I'm looking through it right here, and um, and I'm looking at the date. So I'm, I'm in September of 71, I, I, and he has a lot of stuff in, in this period which is not uh, related to um, – um, their project. He, he's he's noting down a whole lot of stuff from about his his, his own um, analysis. But uh, um, he talks about a dream he has of Fanny Deleuze dying. Um, that's in uh, fall of seventy one. Let me let me get. He's talking about his girlfriends, as it were. Um, so let me get in. Let me get closer to the publication date because this this goes on and on. In 1971, um, he talks about Lacan. Um, that's the that's an interesting aspect of it. Um, um, the uh, Lacan was pressing Guattari. The worm, word, word had gotten out that to Lacan that these guys were up to something, um, and uh, um, he and there's almost. Uh, um, a friend came by to see me. This is September of 71. He was troubled by a very real request to have to choose between Guattari, quote, who wants to form a fifth group and Lacan's school. Um, uh, in short, Gleuze and Guattari, um, this is the complaint, used my presentation of Oedipus as a myth. This is Lacan's uh, complaint. Used the, my presentation of Oedipus as a myth to develop the thesis. Um, Lacan says it's a departure from my thinking. Um, they're going to come out with their book, and I will have to rectify mine. It's not those who make the most noise who. Um, um, so anyhow, um, actually, sorry, this is not Lacan is saying that. It's a guy named uh, Bullock, and there's a footnote. I have to, I have to, you know, track this down. Who who they're referring to? Um, his name is Jean Claude Bullock. A book called uh, Medicine of Capital um, that w that came out in 1971. And this guy was all paranoid that Deleuze and Guattari's book was going to make them make him have to redo his own book. But clearly, there was a lot of stuff going on, uh, work, uh, rumors about the work uh, that they were doing together. And then Guattari says a couple of days later, uh, the disinformation is getting worse. Urgent convocation to Lacan's office. Question, what have you done over the past two years? We've lost contact. I'm not trying to reprimand you. This is Lacan speaking. You're still part of the Ecole. I accept divergences. That's why I founded the Ecole, but dot, dot, dot. He wanted to see the manuscript. I retreated behind Gilles, who only wants to show him something completely finished. I told him that I still consider myself to be a frontline Lacanian, but I've chosen to scout out areas that have not been exploited much explored much instead of trailing in the wake. Um, we got we get down to business. If I, if I want him, Lacan, to put a lid on the rumor that is spreading about the book, what Gilles said at Vincennes, I need to give him the means to intervene, quote, before it's too late. Um, since I can't give him the manuscript he wants me to, um, he wants me to talk to him. Impossible to back out. Dinner invitation next week to lay the cards out on the table. Oh no! <laughs> um, yeah. So the plot thickens, and so, um, um, so meanwhile, the the uh, the this he uh, Guattari sent this stuff to uh, Gilles and Fanny, and Gilles and especially Fanny reacted strongly to the last few pages of this diary. They said that I'm making myself look good. I talk about other now analysts, but hold back on talking about myself, a few vague illusions about my private life and nothing more. They're referring to my relationship with Catherine. So this has nothing to do with Lacan, really. Um, so he's there. there um, let me see here. Uh, yeah. So we're getting, getting. OK, so OK, here we go. So November 1971, both books are finished. This is uh, anti-Oedipus and um, uh, psychoanalysis and transversality, which fascinates and irritates me. I have to, to account for them. I'll have to say things, answer questions. Things will be thought about them and positions taken. What a pain. <laughs> there will be consequences. 
I feel like scrunching myself up to, into a little ball, becoming tiny, putting an end to this whole politics of presence and prestige, stay in a corner with little things that don't interest anyone, to such an extent that I almost blame Gilles for having dragged me into this mess. Until I could, until now, I could talk, then turn my back on whatever I was saying. I was never really engaged, and now everything has to be accounted for, and people will hold me up to what I'm saying. The field is unified. The plane of consistency of writing doesn't let anything go. Every blow is counted. It's something that fucking sends death right up my spine. Up until now, I could hide using all kinds of avoidance behaviorisms, but now... Everything is inscribed, something irreversible with Lacan and maybe with Jean Ouri, the guy he worked with at Laborde, mm -hmm. and even Laborde. Um, so that's the sort of that's the first um, the sort of the first you know, sort of outburst, if you will, of um, him regarding the publication. And then then um, that's so funny. the start. Of, it's amazing. <laughs> and then anti Oedipus comes out. And um, he says, do I have to write this down? An event, so what? Pleasantries. I'm writing this down, but my mind is elsewhere. Um, Andy Oedipus came out 10 days ago. Review copies. First reaction, his girlfriend, Jeanette, tells Le Maire, our friendly property owner, this book will, is really problematical. I don't agree with it at all. She's read 30 pages. I'm even thinking about quitting at uh, at the Paris Paris Three Sancier because you know Felix. Oh, she's saying this. I'm thinking of quitting at Sancier because you know Felix is my friend and I don't want to have to attack him. And you know he's not a doctor. He has no clinical experience. So you know this is somebody who's close to him um, who's reacting. So he's dealing with um, the different reactions uh, of people around him. Um, yeah. So anyway, I haven't. I didn't find that. The, I didn't find the quote that we were looking for. Um, and it might. It might actually be earlier um, when he's still uh, in the process of um, uh, composing uh, with the Liz. But uh, there is a comment about Lacan again in March of '72. Back to Lacan. Rupture with the Liz, who was taking me too far. Father, mother, brothers found at the moment of death. Oedipal happiness, the politics of the father, the brutality that overwhelms me with Arlette that she can't stand, will to power, desire to seize, to control her, crush the polyvocality of her desire, all the little things, complicity between her and Gilles on the secret. I will lie to her, but Arlette, I've been trying to tell you. <laughs> I was, I've been trying to tell you for all these years that this is this is going to be a, this is going to be one hell of a book. Um, yeah. But anyhow, yeah, he, he, he makes this, he, he makes a comment about is he's, he's being overcoded. Um, that's, that's what we were looking for earlier. He's being overcoded by Deleuze, um, that uh, Deleuze's comments and the way Deleuze is editing things, um, is a, a vast overcoding of his own kind of thinking and, um, sort of, you know, um, uh, if you will, uh, uh, um, if you will, blocking him out as it were um and yeah, uh he seems yeah. to complain about that a lot in interviews and it seems to be like a problem like um just you know me looking as an outsider looking in um you know it seems to be just like in general he sent, tends to be overcoated by Deleuze yeah well for sure uh yeah on the other hand he he, he hasn't published a whole lot and Deleuze has mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. You know, I mean, he's, you know, <laughs> you know, if, if, he, if he got a, if he got a formula for working that kind of works, if you got an editor, in this case, Minui, who um, expects you to deliver, um, well, the loser answer to that is, okay, we're going to deliver. Um, and it may not be the perfect text for everyone involved, but uh, himself included. But on the other hand, you know, um, it, 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 it gets things done. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I was thinking about this while you were talking about the, um, just the history of, you know, just um, pulling out old files, archiving, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, me coming into this in 2020, 
very it was very interesting a totally different experience than even say 10 20 years ago because um these texts are you know readily accessible through piracy online right it's very easy you can't get everything right but you can get a, pretty much like all of these you know translated books and everything and um you know it seems like there were multiple waves of translations with mm -hmm. uh guatri in particular and you know they're all coming at me you know all at once right as opposed to sure. something that's being doled out over time and this is interesting because you know my first ex what i learned was like my first exposure to these ideas were actually the attempted suppression of them right um there was this article that was made in the 90s uh i think it was yeah it was uh it was just richard dawkins doing a book review where he was just dunking on these guys right and it was getting popular in the online atheist circles that i was involved in in the 2010s right and this was the first time i had ever heard of these guys right and when i went back and i learned and i learned about them and i was like well what was going on with that right i looked back mm -hmm. and i realized that learning and trying to understand these things in 1998 is a completely different experience than in 2020 2021 where i can just look everything up online right and not only right. that but you also have like this isn't true for every pdf but you can you can search for you know quotations you can look for things so like verifying whether or not something is true verifying whether or not somebody said something understanding all that is a completely different experience than it was even 10 years ago let alone 50 years ago um you know like you had to really pick apart these pieces from you know kind of just like things coming your way almost like things being flown your way just circumstance while in my case um it was almost like a bunch of people were talking about anti-oedipus all at once in 20, 2019 2020 and mm -hmm. i don't remember exactly what their interest was i i wasn't that interested in it actually at first what got me into mm -hmm. it was i found out about I don't know if you know about this, but um, Guattari tried to make a screenplay or a movie, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like really enamored by this idea, like this tragedy that this philosopher was unable to make his art, right? Like he could do his philosophy stuff, but couldn't make his art. And then I found out that later that uh, <laughs> some people don't take his philosophy very seriously either. Right. But right. Um, but yeah, so. Um, I, I I read it and I you know I fell in love with it and what was very interesting to me and you know um, something I think about a lot with just engaging with his work is this is that you know I have a lot of problems with reading I really struggle with reading actually and some days I just can't read at all because I get very sick I get ma bad migraines and his writing style in that because it's a screenplay was made his ideas a lot more accessible right and it was and and mm -hmm. i've been writing about this experience that i had with it again recently and i'm thinking like it's crazy how in 2016 they translated this into english so it was only around for a few years accessible to me before i even came across it you know uh 10 years ago i wouldn't have had any access to it it wasn't even known about right mm -hmm. and there's so many cases of that and i guess what i'm starting to get at here is and something that i found really interesting when i was looking into you know your work and i was like kind of going over your book and stuff was um the internet and its interaction with discussing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um Deleuze and Guattari I think it's like you know what I thought was very interesting for example when I first flipped open your book and just went to a random page as I normally do with reading um I noticed that you were talking about um the Deleuze's death through email mm -hmm. And I thought that mm -hmm. was very interesting. And I kind of wanted to know more about how the early internet, like, really interacted and spread these ideas. And what do you think may have led to the point where me, as just some random guy, comes across this stuff? 
you know. Uh, well, there's a lot. That's that's two big questions. It's a big question, <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, actually, more than one. Um, so, um, well, how you come across it is just the, the nature of the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like you come across a piece of crabgrass um, that I haven't seen before. And you pointed it out. You pointed out to me, you know. Hey, look at that. There's a, there's a spot there we hadn't seen before. You know, you find it and you start looking at it. You know, and it becomes interesting to you, and you you keep following it down into its roots. So that's sort of how the internet works. Um, you know, one thing. You know, the rab the old proverbial rabbit hole. Um, I'm sure you know. You know what I mean when you're trying to do something and all of a sudden you're online and you suddenly find yourself a half hour later not doing what you're originally doing because you found something interesting that you sort of scurry down and check out. Um, but what happened in terms of what happened in terms of the internet was there were all these um, in the 1990s. Um, this is sort of, I don't know, this is pre, this is just when Windows was coming in. Um, and, and the web in terms of as we know it today, um, was barely barely existent um we we didn't get the kinds of browsers that we have uh we have available to us today until you know towards the end of the the 90s yeah and even then the browsers were, were kind of clunky because computers were kind of clunky suddenly you started to have to have more and more memory in your computers just to be able to handle the load of the stuff that you were dumping in to your to your um, system, and it's or just as bad sit today. Sit there, yeah, and it's just as bad today. It's just that you know you got to you just got to keep upping the game, and it depends on what you know. It depends on what you use the computer for. As I've discovered when I've gone computer shopping, uh, I'm not a gamer, so consequently my needs are much less than somebody who does gaming and does a lot of movie watching and and on and on and on. Um, so uh, I'm just really sort of text based um, and that sort of limits the kind of memory I need. But still, um, there are more and more sophisticated servers and, and sites and and there are podcasts that I'd like to listen to. And I don't like lag. I don't like, you know, so it's, uh, you know, um, but what we had in the 1990s were these listserv groups. And you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, we had these listserv groups and there was a sort of central location and that's the that's where um i posted i mean that's where i learned that deliza died was on our listserv group this friend of ours who's now she's australian and she's back in she's been in back in uh sydney for for decades but she was living in paris and 1995 and in fall of 1995 and uh so deliza just died and so she posted that onto the group so it went across you know the planet uh, the, through this listserv group, so we knew it. You know, uh, um, I don't want to say instantaneously, but as close to that as possible at that time. Um, and um, but the listserv group served because listserv was organized on various kinds of strings, as they were known. That is subject um, subject strings. So you know, you might not be involved um, in every string. Uh, although you could have access to them because you could see what the strings were. Um, but if you were, you know, commenting on particular strings, then, then that, you know, that was de facto being involved, and consequently you were included, and you can re read um, what everybody's various kinds of comments were. And those were uh, sort of a early, um, you know, proving ground for um, a lot of people's... Uh, um, readings and reactions and and uh, to um different kinds of things that that, that they were responding to uh in Deleuze and Guattari's text and so, like, um, was this like on the universities like I don't actually know much about like the early early internets like topology well this was um the 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 listserv that we were on was situated i believe in a website at the university of virginia um and um so th that's my best recollection right now i'd have to go look it back up but i i do believe that that was the case um 
It was called D D and G list at, um, and, uh, and, and the reason it was at the university of Virginia was that there was, um, there was a guy there. Oh God. It's amazing how I forget names who, um, uh, God, um, started a journal at the, one of the first online journals. Um, it was just sort of like a, such a radical idea at the time. Um, articles completely posted. And I want to say, uh, um, it was, it was postmodern, um, postmodern something. Um, and, uh, let me, I'm looking it up here. Um, uh, yeah, a, a guy named, here we go. The guys, one of the guys, one of the founders was Al E Y A L uh, Amiran A M I R A N, and um, he uh, was at. He's an associate professor. Uh, well, he was a professor, associate professor at Michigan State, um, and I'm trying to find his, uh, you know, his web profile. Um, but he founded a journal with a uh, another guy who was at the University of Virginia, and it was the guy at the University of Virginia. Who um, with with this um, online journal um, was able to um, uh, host this particular uh, reading group, uh, uh, among other things. Um, so that's that's you know that that and and various other uh, reading lists were um, uh, hosted by uh, at other at other sites, and um, so it varied you know from location to location. Oops. So I'm just trying to tr track down here. Um, I mean, I'm, this, is, this is like this is, this is great for someone who's over 70 to try to uh, you know get your jog your brain into uh, to, to remembering stuff that you you knew about uh, uh, 10 years ago. Oh yeah, didn't I remember that? Oh yeah, 20 years ago. Oh yeah, I remember him. I mean, to think the fact that I'm able to been able to find uh, this guy's name uh, is uh, uh, is already a step in the right direction. So I might even actually have some answers here in a second. But you should feel free to jump in. Right. Yeah. So um, he's at uh, UCAL Irvine now. Um, and uh, um, but he was at the University of Virginia. That's it. In the late he did his PhD at the University of Virginia. So he was involved in uh, postmodernism and so forth. And the guy who he, um, the name of their journal was called Postmodern Culture and still is. It still uh, exists today. Um, and the guy he co edited with was a guy named John Unsworth. Um, they published a book of, of writings from the, the online journal um, in 1993 in print, you know, which we thought, I recall, we thought at the time was. Uh, a, a little peculiar, um, but nonetheless, um, they still have the journal Postmodern Culture that's hosted still to today through Johns Hopkins University. So, um, so yeah, so um, that was that was how we uh, um, we communicated, and um, there was a time there also. I mean, we had a, a conference at. Um, constant this is this is sort of off offline we had a real life conferences sequence of conferences um that was hosted by constantine bundes um at uh, trent university in peterborough ontario um three big deleuze conferences one in 92 one in 97 and one in 2004 and the one in 2004 after that one um I started what was basically just a mailing list. And what I did was I took, um, you know, all the email addresses I could get from everybody that was at the conference, that conference, plus all these other email addresses that I could sort of, you know, scrounge up from here and there from Deleuze people that I knew of. And um, also, I can't remember how I did this because um, it was really pre-Facebook. Uh, but I put out a call to anybody who was interested in Deleuze studies to just send me their email and we get them on this list. And then for about, I'll say, seven or eight years, eight, maybe let's make it a round number, 10 years, um, I had this mailing list. And so people knew that they could email something to me 
and then I could blast this thing out to all kinds of people across the planet. Um, and so that's what I was doing. I was sort of like uh, Deleuze Central, um, only because I selected myself to do so. And I had a website, a uh, personal web page through Wayne State University that I'd set up that was sort of a Deleuze, Deleuze Guattari clearinghouse of all kinds of links. So if you if you wanted to find something that I had found, <laughs> which didn't mean it was everything, but it was just stuff that I'd found on a particular kind of topic or a uh, relationship to Deleuze and Guattari, um, you could uh, go to my site and then scroll down through the different pages to see if I had been able to list this this particular thing that you were interested in. And those were early days of stuff. You know, now you know there's all kinds of more sophisticated ways. My 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 mailing list became completely defunct when uh, we had things like you know we had the social media uh, uh, available. So we got Deleuze. I mean, I can blast out to Facebook. You know, in a matter of minutes. Uh, cross cross posting, of course, um, but you know, blast out you know the latest thing that we've posted um, on uh, the Deleuze seminars site, um, and it's easily done. It's much more effective than the the, the little list that I had uh, coming out of my computer. But those are um, those are some different ways that we we handle that stuff. That's interesting, though, because that does mark a transition between like you owning like the list and then working within the confines of like social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the confines, I suppose you want to call it that, but I don't I, I don't find oh, it confines in the sense that, you know, it, it, it it's certainly it, it's a, it's much more efficient. Um, it just gets, you know, and I always put, you know, you know apologies for cross posting and then blast it you know uh, on five or six different lists that probably have the same people on it but uh, but you know there is the odd person who might not be on list x that uh, that's on list y and uh, so you know I think I there think you, you are go. pointing out though something that I've thought about a lot. Like, um, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but um, during the two thousands, before so social media, so my exposure to the internet. I was born in ninety three, so my exposure to the mm -hmm. internet was a lot more commercial, and it was also from a much younger age, right? So when I mm -hmm. first came on the internet, I was asking questions about my favorite video games, you know, and I was exposed right. to the, you know, the the commercialization of like just just like video games um you know kind of like forming their own spaces online in these online communities and there would be like these different forums where uh people would talk about like different games there'd be like one for like diff each kind of game and then there'd be like one for like big series and stuff like that and what ended up happening with social media is they ended up breaking these communities um, down and apart and migrating them towards social media, right? And the reason why I said confines is because from my perspective, right, and it's probably totally different because of, you know, just our goals and our experiences and stuff, but, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, it went from, you know, having control over, you know, how you were doing things to having to deal with this system that you don't understand how it fully works, you don't understand how it chooses uh, what gets posted, what gets shown to you. There's like this sort of, you know, distance that is evoked from, sure. you know, social, social media, right? <clears throat> and what's interesting is, is I think that the, um, something that's going on right now, as you're probably aware, and I'm I suck at it. I I have not figured out how to use it. But you may have heard of the Fediverse, right? Where they have websites that are kind of like popular social media sites. Probably the most well known is Mastodon. Okay. Right. And basically, they are trying to decentralize these kinds of user interfaces. And I think I think that's kind of interesting. You know, mm -hmm. I haven't gotten involved because I don't know how it works, and I'm. I'm I'm starting to show my own age <laughs> when it comes to the internet, which is kind of sad. I'm only thirty. <laughs> how do, how do you spell Fediverse? Um, let me see. Let me type it out. Uh, I think it's spelled like this, or it might be spelled like it's one of those. I think it's the first one. Oh, Fediverse. Okay. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. 
All right. And uh, the most well-known uh, service is Mastodon, and they what they do is people host their own instances. I don't know how they're connect the instances are connected or not. I don't know much about mm -hmm. the interconnectivity between the instances, but this was these. Uh, this is a recent response to like how mm -hmm. essentially all these tiny little spaces online have, uh, including like even your mailing list, right, have kind of like been dumped into this large social space where it can reach anyone, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I don't know, like. I'm kind of rambling right now, but I just kind of wonder what the consequences of that's going to be. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, no, I hadn't heard about this, but I've got a, I've got a site up called, um, it's called the site's called The Verge, and it's got the Fediverse explained. Oh, okay, um, that sounds like yeah, an article just going over. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's February. Um, it's an article um, by David Pierce. Um, it's February 7th, 2024. Um, and he just you know, explains, um, uh, how maybe you've read it here at the verge or some internet, inter, uh, internet old head talking on their blog about how this is the internet they were hoping for back in 1993. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, and so he begins to explain it. Um, and yeah, that's interesting. Now this I'll have to read this. I got it. I got it bookmarked, so I can get back to it later. Zooming back to the '90s, I want to talk a uh -huh. little bit about the internet and subjectification. So, something that I want to eventually do on my channel is I want to explore the, um, you know, from a personal perspective because I grew up through it, um, the mass media subjectification event of Pokemania. You might remember in the late '90s. Pokemon was like everywhere and if you were a kid it was like being submersed mm -hmm. in a completely different world right and that's how I was mm -hmm. exposed to the internet that's how I was exposed to you know all of this stuff right and it reminds me what's very interesting about it specifically being a video game is this is that a video game is uniquely you know designed and positioned to essentially create an interface a machine between you know the player and the the um the video game itself transmitted through the feedback um loop between the controller and the visuals the audio and you know it creates this new experience and you know what i found when i was going through some of the papers that you sent me um a couple weeks ago was you talking about like muds and how they were mm -hmm. creating new kinds of experiences and i think that it would be interesting to you know explore that oops explore that deeper through a uh, you know through the lens of something that wasn't like you know created by like this sort of like mass media event but rather people you know ex you know exploring these games in the early internet days mhm mm well, there's been there's been a number of books written about that. Um, uh, I mean, I know Lisa Nakamura um, has written a book, uh, wrote a book a few years ago on race in cyberspace, but um, that was um, uh, precisely uh, her one of the things that jogged her uh, into. Um, I'm looking up her her website. She's down the road from me at the University of Michigan, um, and uh, just looking at her faculty profile. Her um, yeah, she doesn't put. Um, oh wait, sure, there it is. Um, so she has a book uh, that she wrote and it came out in 2002 called uh, Cyber Types: Race, Ethnicity, and Identity on the Internet. And then um, another one that came in 2007 um, called um, Digitizing Race, Visual Cultures uh, of the Internet. Um, then that's, she has one. That's very another interesting. One. Uh, can you, um, you can send me those in Discord. I can, uh, I'll take a look at those. I think those are interesting because I think race 
is um, mm -hmm. like very relevant with the development of how politics has interacted with the internet. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I don't um, know. I don't know what's in these books, but like I've noticed like a sort of erasure of race, a whiteification almost online, where like mm -hmm. people and and like I've seen it a lot, complained a lot by like black creators and stuff about how online there's like a sort of erasure of this difference. Mm -hmm. Right. But and and that was something that was something that, yeah, that was something that uh, particularly I believe in her cyber types, her first book, I believe that was a, a, a fundamental uh, concern of hers. Um, and uh, she has a book here. I mean, you, you, this sounds right up your alley called uh, this. I'm not sure what year this was published, but let me, see if i can get the publication date it's called techno precarious an analysis that traces the role of digital technology and multiplying precarity danger um she and she's got this she's co-written this with something called the precarity lab um and this is the first that i've um ever heard uh, of this from her because I'm, you know, I don't I haven't looked up her stuff, but I'm writing these stuff down and putting them into um, uh, Discord for you. And I guess the most recent book would be something called Racist Zoom Bombing. That's her book. That's a, it's co-authored with Lisa Nakamura, Hannah Stiverson, and Kyle Lindsay. Um, and I think it's a post post COVID uh, book. It might be it might be an edited volume. I don't know, but in any case, I'm putting all these titles in here for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so that's that's one person. Um, and gosh, um, there are you know I'd have to sort of you know surf around um, to, but I mean, uh, if, if there's a if there's a way of seeing uh, something like if you have put Lisa Nakamura's name in and then. And you'd, you'd also like, <laughs> um, there are, well, of course, oh, what am I thinking? Um, um, there's the, uh, um, let me look this one up because, uh, I can, I can find it pretty fast. Um, this was, this was the sort of the, I don't know if I have already mentioned this to you, um, in a, um, uh, in, uh, a previous message, but, uh, um, there was um, a book by Julian Dibble, D-I-B-B-E-L-L. -L. Um, and he wrote a number of uh, articles in the Village Voice. Um, a particularly uh, amazing one was called A Rape in Cyberspace. Um, and this was about an incident that uh, took place on Lambda Moo. And... Um, he then subsequently um, uh, published a, a book that included um, the. Uh, let me see here. He had a book that came out. Yeah, he he, he had a book that came out um, of the same title. It was called Flame. Uh, yeah, um, there was a the 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 article that um, that he published in the Village Voice um, came out um, in a book called Flame Wars. And that was a discourse on cyberculture, um, and uh, that was that was edited by Mark Derry. Um, Flame uh, Wars, and um, but I'm gonna keep looking up on Dibble because there's more more stuff um, on Dibble. Um, there's a lot to be said about. Um, oh yeah, well he wrote my, there it is, my tiny life. That was it. It's a uh, fabulous little book by Dibble, um, My Tiny Life, and it's all about um, this experiences on uh, these these uh, moose sites, um, the mud sites, and uh, yeah, I mean um, that's that was that whole experience of subjectivity um, and you know desubjectification, but real re re realizing oneself in different forms, um, you know, and there were, you know, you, 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 they should probably look at some of these books about these moos and muds because 
there were these sites, they were called furry muds or furry moos that were, all the characters were animal oh, of I'm different sorts. Furries. <laughs> for the, yeah, furries, okay. And, uh, but these were just sort of the virtuals at, at that point. And, um, and they were, so there were all kinds of different um, types of g gaming sites, uh, if you will, text-based virtual reality sites. Some were based in games. Um, so in other words, if you logged on, in order to in order to create a character, you had to create from a within a set of, of like three or four different types, um, and that pretty much determined at, from that point onward what you were going to be able to do on the site. Um, and so that gaming, I found those kind of game sites rather limiting. Whereas the Lambda Moo and, and, and various other moves, um, postmodern culture, uh, the the oh. journal had its own move for a while. Uh, PMC moo, um, but uh, that didn't last very long. I mean, Lambda really uh, was the one that um, you know had the most uh, creative programming going on uh, within it, and uh, people being able to create create various kinds of you know, vis you know they weren't visual. They were all everything was text based, but you know nonetheless, um, this was still early days. We're still talking mainly the nineteen uh, the nineteen nineties. Um, four or five years during the 90s when that was really big. And then suddenly the um, platform for um, accessing um, the web via um, uh, the different uh, ser uh, interfaces, um, you know, browsers came, came about. And then once people started going into having browser experiences and being able to, you know, be, in, be able to actually have images, then various, you know, numerous other kinds of sites uh, yeah, came into being and made these text-based sites sort of quaint, you know, like uh, people look back on some of the early gaming, you know, uh, Atari and so forth. Yeah. I think that um, the introduction of images also really influenced how people constructed their identities in cyberspace because sure. they would reflect – um, you know, they reflect on an avatar, like a profile picture. And, you know, as they change their profile picture, they kind of adjust themselves to adapt to that. And I remember reading a lot of people talking about this phenomenon, where they would change their profile picture, and they'd notice themselves adapting to it, or they might see somebody with, a, I think the one that I think of the most when I see on Discord, whenever I see somebody with a cat profile picture, it's like, they give me a certain vibe. I don't know how to describe it, but um, <clears throat> I think that really changed things because in a way it gave us a, a, a visual face to look at constantly when we are interacting uh -huh. with it. And you see that a lot with um, <laughs> modern games. Like uh, furries, a lot of times, I don't, I'm not a furry, but I've ex tried to experiment with their subculture a couple times. So I'm a bit familiar with, you know, some of the things that they have they have different games usually they're like just like mmos or something where you play with a bunch of different players and what's very interesting and different in comparison to what was experienced in the 90s is because there's a lot more ability to show these and produce these assets now with the memory capacity we now are um depicting ourselves in specific images now um some games um, I can't think of anything on the top of my head, actually, because these games tend to come and go. But um, a lot of these games, you have like a limited selection of animals that you can select from, and you'll role play as these animals. While others like um, Second Life and VR Chat, it's possible to have your own models inserted, right? And I think it just like adds this extra dimension you know what i mean where mm -hmm. it's like you're mm -hmm. you're um instead of describing people instead of describing things you're seeing them and i think that's really interesting because um when i i got first into you know developing indie games i've never released one so you can't you know you can you can play like demos online but not a full game but uh i got into indie game dev through blind people Right. And, you know, blind people, you know, are not, you know, interacting, you know, not all blind people 
I like this, right? Blind, mm -hmm. blind, blindness is a spectrum that has a wide variety of presentations. But the thing that's interesting about interacting with largely blind communities and interacting with, you know, uh, trying to design a blind accessible game is, is, is that you no longer have the image to work with. You have to deconstruct what that image means and figure out how to explain those elements in other ways, right? And so it's almost like, I guess what I'm trying to get here at here is, is, is that um, <clears throat> these visual representations introduce like this sort of um, like new element to this experience that is, you know, I don't know. Like, maybe I'm just rambling here, <laughs> but, like, I'm just kind of spitballing and trying to think about these ideas, but, um... Keep spitballing. No, it's good. Yeah, um, but no, like, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, is that I, I think it's, I think what's interesting is, is, is that, you know, there is a movement to try to take this difference between these two experiences and bring them together through, mm -hmm. um accessibility and mm -hmm. i'm kind of i'm i'm just interested in what the consequences i think of that is in the long run because this accessibility is not just influencing obviously just um disabled people it's something that is available to anyone to interact with it's what's happening is is, is that we're taking these interfaces right that makes mm -hmm. assumptions based on um you know, our bodies, right? People can see, people can hear, people move in a certain way, right? And we're realizing that doesn't work with everybody, right? So in mm -hmm. a sense, we are adapting these interfaces to make our bodies more smooth with our interaction mm -hmm. with cyberspace. And mm -hmm. I think that's also going on outside of accessibility. I think that's, I think that's the process that we are experiencing as this, uh, as these, I don't want to say standards, but like as these uh, expectations of how we interact with, you know, um, games in general evolve over time. Mm -hmm. And does this have a does this have an intersection with what you mentioned earlier, the Fediverse? Hmm. I think so, but I haven't fully explored it yet. There's mm -hmm. um, something that is interesting now that I think about it is, is that um, I, I need to research this in more detail. But uh, in over the summer last year, uh, Reddit changed their API conditions, right, which made it exorbitantly expensive in order to use their API for third party programs. Now, this was a huge issue for blind users because blind people uh, the regular Reddit interface is just not blind accessible. There's a lot of gaps, and they've just never addressed it, which is crazy because that's technically illegal, and, you know, they can sue for a lot of money for that, right? But they're still able mm -hmm. to get away with it, right? <laughs> and it's very obvious that when they put out this API change, they did not consider um, their disabled users, and as a result... Um, I think there is a Fediverse version of Reddit that um, our blind has moved to, but I need to look into this more. I ha I don't interact with the Fediverse that much, so I don't know much about it. But I am assuming that part of that is definitely because of the accessibility concerns that Reddit has had and its hostile, um, its its hostile uh, approach to third party apps. You know, this is actually a problem with a lot of modern social media. Uh, Discord is pretty infamous for, you know, you can, in theory, right? So I'm a, I'm a software developer, right? So in theory, you can take the requests that Discord is sending, right? And build your own interface that captures those requests and displays your own interface, right? You can build it from scratch. But the problem is, is, is that they build a lot of checks to make sure that you are using their first party interface and this was a problem because blind accessibility in discord historically was not very good until the last few years and mm -hmm. as a result like people i lost a lot of connections 
when I moved to Discord. You know, I used to use Skype. I used to talk to a lot of blind people on Skype, and you'd move to Discord, and they couldn't use it, and there was no third-party app that they would be able to use. So, you know, that's one development that's occurring, I think, because of the Fediverse, because it's an open source federated, you know, set of instances. Uh -huh. And I think that's a really wow. interesting development. Yeah, it is. Um, this explanation I was just, you know, mentioning, uh, they're on the verge, you know, sort of, you know, lends credence to that for sure. Going back to Deleuze, um, I'm not like a huge Deleuze reader, um, mm -hmm. so I'm 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 a, I'm missing gaps. But something that I'm actually kind of interested in, and I'm kind of curious on what your take is about this. Like something I've thought a lot about is Deleuze's disability. You know, he's got all those. He's always had health issues, right? Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. always had issues mm -hmm. with breathing. And I've always mm -hmm. wondered, what do you think? Like, is the impact that that had on his work? Hmm. Yeah, he, well, he kind of, he kind of talks about this. Um, in, I mean, if you look at the ABC there, um, the letter M, M as in maladie, illness, um, he talks about that m m to some extent. Um, and, I, you know, but, but not, I mean, he, he's very, he's extremely reticent, um, if not completely hostile, he's completely hostile, that, that's better. He's completely hostile to the kind, to do the kind of navel gazing that would sort of be able to provide uh, the clear answer um, to that question. That's totally and so, understandable. You know, he just doesn't, he, he has a peculiar um um definition in the abecedar of what he calls the personal which he considers to be in some ways despicable um and that comes out uh at the time particularly of him and parnay doing these recordings uh so that would be 88 89 um there was a whole trend or had been a whole trend towards um um this sort of auto fiction um that still still proliferates today um but basically the way Deleuze describes it very very contemptuously is uh um it, he would say it's not because uh it's not because I have my little my itty bitty story itty bitty personal story that I have anything to say and yet that trend um tends to be the, the at the time uh in the period of the 80s late 80s uh at least um but i think it, it went on well beyond that in various manifestations um tends to be the, the 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 hook for many of the publishers uh in in the french scene at least um and um he had a lot of contempt for that the personal and, and um Parnay pro probes him, challenges him on that, and she, he says, "She said, well, what about Natalie Sarot? Um, she writes on the personal, and he just jumps down Parnay's throat and says, no, no, just because she's anything that Natalie Sarot wrote um, was never personal. Yeah, it was, it was for Deleuze that the difference is more of a style stylistics um, that is, if you will, a personal." Um, it's not that the personality doesn't show through. Of course it does, but it's done in a way that allows for the style itself to take over. And his 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 heroes uh, on this are, are well, Jack Kerouac is one one author that he names um, who became more and more and that went more and more in that direction. But he 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 certainly uh, adores not M Natalie Duras. Excuse me, Margaret du Marguerite Duras is. Uh, fiction as well as her cinema, um, and uh, but Natalie Sarot, he speaks highly of her. So these are these different French writers that um, he, he really doesn't have much to say about the personal. Getting back to your question, um, you know, it, it I don't know how a guy 
so struck by that kind of uh, impairment, if if I can put it that way, that as a lack of breath, um, was able to do what he did um, in uh, in the time frames that we're discussing. Um, I mean, if you take the, just the period that preceded his encounter with Guattari, um, clearly he had been working on these different texts prior to working with Guattari for, for, for several years. But in a space of um, 18 months to two years, he published his um, uh, Expressionism book on Spinoza, followed by Difference and Repetition, so his Expressionism book was his minor doctoral thesis. Difference in Repetition was his major doctoral thesis. And then the following year, Logic of Sense. I mean, and this is a guy who at this very time is suffering from this increasingly debilitating um, uh, lung uh, malady that would require a lung to be removed in an operation in January of 1969, following which he was presumably uh, recuperating. And that recuperation, let's just say it lasted from uh, the end of January to middle of April, at which point Guattari showed up. Um, and then Deleuze somehow um, and I would say that Fanny Deleuze was the angel uh, behind uh, much of uh, these the possibilities that we're talking about here. Um, uh, he and Guattari went into full gear on on starting in, in summer, certainly summer of 1969, when they started having their first really serious discussions that would lead to Anti-Oedipus and the Thousand Plateaus. I mean, they went full bore on this stuff. To the point that by by fall of 1970, and and then certainly into 71, um, Deleuze was able to um, teach, uh, start teaching some of the stuff that would be in in Anti Oedipus, um, and by fall of 71, we have we have nine um, transcripts from 71, 72. Um, there you can see that the, they're well along in developing uh, uh, Anti Anti Oedipus. In fact. The Guattari, right? Guattari wrote down the date of November seventeenth, nineteen seventy-one. I just was reading it uh, while I was thumbing through through the book. That's the date that he gives of basically they're done with anti Oedipus. Obviously, the book doesn't come out for another four months, but those were the days in which you actually had to typeset, you know, and you had to do proofs from galleys. And and I have I've had to do that with all my books uh, up until probably right now, <laughs> um, and uh, so you know uh, th there was a time lag uh, needed for uh, books to be actually come out in print. Um, so uh, yeah, so um, I don't know how he did what he did, um, and one of the ways he did it though was that he got a massive. Um, uh, consideration when he got hired by uh, it was he was approached first by Michel Foucault to teach at Vincennes, but by the time Deleuze got there because of his illness, um, Foucault had uh, had moved on to the College of France, and so Deleuze's main main boss in philosophy was Francois Chatelet, but um, um, when uh, he taught at Vincennes. He was only given one seminar, and that was not the usual course load. Um, I don't know what the usual course load was. I've got a friend who, who loves this kind of uh, French uh, university um, picayune stuff, um, and I could probably ask him. But the Liz, uh, for as a consideration of his health limitations, he was given one seminar to teach, and he taught that every Tuesday, uh, Tuesday morning. And um, so uh, he that, and that's what that was his load throughout his entire career. So that was w one thing he taught less. And the other thing he did was he taught towards his writing. 
um, because you can see where the overlap is between his books and um, the seminar topics that he chose. And that's that's obvious if you just look at the main menu of our website and then you put a you put a bibliography of Deleuze's text alongside that uh, menu and you'll see you'll see it it just jumps out at you um, but yeah no there was I mean there was I mean definitely a, a, an impact um, but I can't say a limitation because of what I've just um, described to you it's if in any if any if anything, it made him work harder. Yeah, it almost seems like to me, like just, you know, looking in, like, you know, I, I think about it from my own personal experiences. You know, there are days where I just can't read because I get migraines, I get sick. Um, you know, it, it, it can be really rough. And, you know, what I do on those days is I take what little I can do and I kind of put it towards a larger project right and then when i have the days where i'm more active the days that i'm more able and capable i'm able to take all those pieces and assemble them into something larger and you know i think it's a matter of you know when you're in that situation when you are um and obviously i have you know i'm i'm more on the uh, the mental side i and he's more on the physical side but like when you have those kinds of time stealing you know experiences right you organize your time a lot more carefully you uh, mm -hmm. sure and you know i'm sure that a lot of his downtime you know wasn't just spent idly but even in even in lapses of consciousness you're still you know you're still producing you're still creating you know new ideas that can lead to something you know in the future and i think that also you know a big part of uh something that i notice you know even as somebody's not super into him um i notice his passion he's absolutely extremely passionate you know and when you're so passionate about something and you want to understand it so thoroughly you want to understand it in every you know possible direction that you can you know mm -hmm you're going to it's not just a matter of and i'm sure you can relate to this yourself it's not just a matter of you know i'm going to go and do it you're going you're you structure it there's a, there's a there's a pathway there's a there's a there's a way about of going about doing things mm -hmm. right yeah of and i think that's very interesting because i think you can i think you can really especially see it with um I think you can really especially see it with both Deleuze and Guattari. Like, um, this is just my own speculation, but uh, Guat kind of gives me bipolar vibes. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, some ways, like, yeah. He has a whole period of his life where he's just very down and depressed, but then he has other periods of his life where he's very active and productive. And that's another mode right. where you can see where, you know, and I'm not going to, um, I think like labeling that as a disability is kind of like, I think that's a modern thing in the last mm -hmm. 30 years. But I, I think like, if we want to look at it more like neutrally, it's more like, it's more like a disorganized productivity, but like, you know, even in those down periods, he, you know, he's still productive. Even when he's, he's sitting in front of the TV and just wasting away there's still something going on in there. And it's, it's kind of interesting because um, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting how uh, in, I haven't read this in a while, but you know, uh, Bifo's book about Guattari, right? Um, mm -hmm. He talks about how he's like watching the TV, right? And I think it's really interesting how in Three Ecologies, right? A few years later, he's talking literally about stuff that he watched on TV. It's coming back out the, of the wash, right? <laughs> and I think that those insights are also really, and, and some people might just be like, oh, it doesn't matter what some guy who doesn't understand what he's, he's just watching some crap on TV. It doesn't matter what he's talking about. But I think that's actually really important because it provides a lot of insight on what people saw from TV at that time, too. <clears throat>
Listen, I'm going to probably have to go here uh, shortly. Um, no, that's but, fine. I uh, need to go too. And I'm, let me, I'm going to paste something into um, the, the line here, see if it works um, to paste. I think I can just paste. Yeah, there we are. Um, so I pasted this into you. It's a, it's a chapter um, that I've written for this maybe manuscript um, on uh, the seminars. And um, this, I may have told you about this. It, it has, um, I, I was it, I was fascinated by this period we were talking about of 69, 70, 71, um, which um, is one of the periods in Deleuze's life, which should be well documented. And in fact, seems to be kind of murky. Um, that is when, before he went and started teaching at Vincennes, um, when did he start at Vincennes? Um, what was he teaching at Vincennes? Um, how did that relate to his work with Guattari, which started in 1969? So there are a number of things that we can document through letters that they exchange and so forth, and particularly thanks to Guattari's anti-Oedipus papers. Um, but I just wanted to get all this nailed down because that, that year, that first year at Vincennes, 1970-71, is a complete blank. We don't have any transcripts from that. Um, we only have the suggestion that he taught a, a seminar called Desire and Logic and a seminar called uh, Spinoza and Logic. Um, and other than that, um, we don't know anything. But so what I try to do in this paper is to show actually that we do know stuff. Um, and, and so that's why I trace, um, not just in terms of what Deleuze said about what he was doing in that uh, teaching year, um, but also what Guattari and he were talking about in the notes that they were exchanging back and forth um, in that period, that very same period. And uh, so it's, it might be of interest to you, particularly since at the end of it, uh, I put an appendix in um, the one thing that the guys in um, the, uh, th they left some, they left, um, um, the the um, editor um, who did the anti Oedipus papers um, show they chose to actually the guy who did the original the French they chose to organize these um, different entries um, into six it's actually well, five major subheading major headings but they're not chronological and so what I did is I did an appendix where I put in chronological order the um, uh, exchanges the, from Guattari, the entries from Guattari, to try to get a sense of from the earliest to the end, which was you know, some, from early 70 into, or mid-70 into 71 up to 72, just to try to get a sense of what the arc was in a chronological order of the kind of text, the kinds of uh, topics that he was sending to Deleuze. And because I was, what I was you know, hoping to do, and didn't do it as successfully as I would have liked, was to sort of be able to sort of link up those topics with what Deleuze himself um, may have been teaching. And there I didn't, I don't think I did that very well at all. But uh, at least uh, I, tr I transposed the, um, uh, the the con the contents, if you will, the table of contents of the anti Oedipus papers into a chronological sequence. So um, it it makes more for me. It makes more sense to see it that way, um, whereas the editor decided to do it thematically, um, and and it was and it's roughly thematic at best if you look at the, the at the book itself. Yeah. So anyhow, you can have you have some. <laughs> So anyhow, you can you'll have you'll have that in that appendix. So we'll see what happens. I also submitted this as a journal article to the Liz and Guattari studies, but after it, after the first version being rejected, um, thankfully it was rejected because um, in revising it, I realized that that first that first version was uh, wow, um, it had some howlers in it. Yikes! So really glad that they said, yeah, this is okay, but it needs to go back to the drawing board. And uh, indeed it did. So I'm um, hoping the second version is more up to, uh, up to snuff in, in that regard. Sounds exciting. All right.
Did you did you get it? So I posted it. I hope you got it. Though. Let me see. Uh, last message I have is the Verge thing. There you go. Oh, there it is. Boing. There it is. It just uploaded. Boing. Um, real quick, can you Boing. um link me that archive you were talking about earlier? The archive. Uh, the one with oh, the, the lectures or. Oh sure. The um, when I when I upload this, the, I want to include the links. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um. Well, easy to do. Um. Ding, 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 There we are. Oops. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, so the general, I'm just going to give you the uh, um, general URL um, to this. And uh, there you go. Thank you. And uh, yeah, and that's the, and then you know, up at the upper right, you you see the, there's a set of, links at the top um, and the far right one is seminars and that takes you to the um, the, the main seminar menu um, that I was referring to that you could you know put alongside the bibliography and uh, but there's a number of other things we have explanations of the site and we have a we have a tab called resources which is we want something we're going to be developing um, but basically what we're doing in there is stuff that um, aren't really aren't specifically uh, seminar related, um, but are nonetheless of interest. And the most recent thing is just completely nuts. Um, it's a ninth, it's a 1942 article from um, uh, the French newspaper Figaro, Le Figaro Literary Magazine. Um, and what they did in August of 1942, and remember they're in World War II at this point, in August of 1942, they posted, uh, excuse me, they um, published um, the uh, compositions of three of the best, um, the three of the best compositions from that year's French high school uh, students' ex final exam, the baccalauréat. And Deleuze was, was posted, was published on the front page. And way. it's way, and That's it's so a short, cool. it's a short composition that he wrote on a 18th century moralist named Vauvenard. Um, this is an exercise in French composition as well as French thinking. I had to do to learn how to do this when I was at the Sorbonne. And basically you're given um, a, a quote from some somebody or some kind of pithy statement, an aphorism of some sort. And, you're, and then you're supposed to comment on it. And your comment has to be both um, well organized, has to be well written stylistically, and it has to have some semblance of depth. Um, <laughs> and Deleuze does a great job. And he's 17 years old uh, at this point. Um, and uh, so the link we have here uh, is to the translation I did. Uh, to this of this essay in, in English, but also there's a link to the um, original uh, French article uh, if you want to see what that looks like, which is uh, uh, the the the, the uh, that, that's quite a hoot um, if you look if you look at that just to see the old style of a 1942 newspaper and Deleuze's thing posted right there, and uh, the thing that's the funniest uh, about this is the um, grade he got um, for this exam. Um, the French system had a grading uh, system um, over 20 points, okay? And Deleuze got a 17 uh, over 20, um, which is extraordinarily good in, in the French system. Um, and then the corrector wrote the following comments, uh, incontestable talent, a clear and strong composition, not badly written, somewhat lacking in modesty or moderation. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! So, eh, give him, give him twenty, twenty-five uh, years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll see. He'll get much more modest <laughs> as the years go along. He'll do a lot more and a lot better, and he'll get a lot more modest. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. So, uh, so the resources is sort of a a cool little thing we've got on there. It's not even our main gig. It's just the kind of thing that we find stuff and 
you know, we put the stuff on there. So uh, the other things we have posted there at the moment are uh, Deleuze's uh, postscript on society of control and the essay called The Grandeur of Yasser Arafat, which was left out of the translation of um, um, the uh, Two Regimes of Madness uh, edition. Um, and we also have a link, um, an audio link, to an to a um, recording that was done in 1980 of Michel uh, uh, a, a a dramatization, if you will, entitled Michel Foucault: A Question of Place, which is a history of Foucault's thought, an uh, oral history of Foucault's thought in 60 minutes. Um, you know, blow your mind. It's so good um, in English, of course. And uh, I I'm planning. I was planning, but I haven't done it to do a, a transcription uh, of this at some point, but, you know, that's really back burner. This is all very cool. I I think I've seen this site before, but not in a long time. Yeah, well, you'll, I keep adding stuff every day, you know, just tinkering away. I'm right now, my, my latest project is to go back through, listen to the 20 sessions of um, Deleuze's final seminar on Leibniz and the Baroque. And um, I've finished uh, um, four of these so far. I've re-listened just to, because it's my translations and I want the translations to be based on as, the, as accurate a transcript as possible. So, I, and it was the first transcripts I did for the site. And I've updated them subsequently, but I just thought I had this itch in the back of my mind that, you know, maybe I ought to just give it one more listen. And, sh and I'm really, really glad I did, because even in the first four, I haven't found, you know, anything massive that was off, but I found little things that were off that were just mistakes, mistakes in listening, um, transpositions, uh, a, a, a sentence or two dropped out somehow uh, in my listening, and I, so I didn't translate them. So, I've you know, I've been going back through really systematically just to try to get all those right and um and that you know just so i feel feel comfortable that i've done the best it's i could of, on this it's, one it's kind of funny um i, I don't want to leave you hanging too long but um no, I, it no. reminds me a little bit of um a little this is kind of like useless trivia but like um so Guattari's birthday on Wikipedia was listed as April 30th for a long uh -huh. time right and mm -hmm. it's very strange because um, in some publications, it says March 30th, and then in some publications, it says April 30th, right? Also, uh -huh. on the other language pages, it says March 30th. So I wondered what was going on, and I think what may have happened is in one of the um, in one of the English earlier English translations, it may have accidentally skipped a month or something. And I I think it's March 30th, but I think it's very uh -huh. interesting because. Like, even, you know, from me, right, as just some person who's poking around and exploring all this cool stuff that you guys have basically found, right, mm -hmm. um, I find these little things, too. And, you know, it teaches, it's not just, oh, this is wrong. It also teaches a little bit of a story about how that information got here. And, you know, to close out, I think one of my concerns moving forward with the future is the relation that this information has with the technology that we're storing it on. Earlier you said something about how back then we didn't have thumb drives, right? Well, right. you know, um, the, the ability to preserve data more and more on these digital devices has the problem of those digital forms of, you know, data preservation being vulnerable, really, the, um, the thing that makes um, data persist in the modern world, right, is not mm -hmm. the fact that it's written down somewhere, it's that it's repeated, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wonder what the consequences of that moving forward, I don't, I don't need a, like a full answer, but I think it's just something to think mm -hmm. about moving forward, you know, in terms of like, regarding like archiving and the process of kind of tra trying to figure out what the hell happened with all this, you know, we're mm -hmm. entering an era uh, where uh, authors on Amazon are being impersonated by AI and are having books published out mm -hmm. that way, right? So there's all these like, things that are coming in. 
and are, you know, essentially challenging our ability to, like, figure out what happened, uh, preserve it, continue to repeat that, right? And I I just Mm -hmm. wonder... Mm -hmm. You know, just this isn't a question. This is more rhetorical, but I just wonder for the future, like where that's gonna go. You know, where, yeah. where, um, <clears throat> you know, yeah. where the nature of data preservation is gonna go. And I think, um, I think that preserving things on, like, one of the things I want to try to uh, get involved in is I would love to try to get involved with like preservation because, like, you know, preserving, preserving it. Um, these kind of texts online where they're accessible not only makes them more accessible to the public but also makes them more accessible to you know people with disabilities and stuff you know through these interfaces like you have these guys who draw a bunch of diagrams that are already confusing to sighted people and now you have to explain that to blind people but now there are ways you know to communicate those ideas to transfer those ideas and transmit those ideas in you know, new ways, but at the same time, we also have the risk of losing the integrity of where those ideas came from. So I just think mm-hmm. that's an interesting thought to close out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree. I'm working on that very topic for this, uh, or aspects of the topic of archiving for this um, plenary uh, talk that I'm giving this summer with Dan Smith. And, you know, we've been talking about the whole archival uh, issue of archiving Um in various ways and uh um you know it, it it you know creates all kinds of challenges and uh particularly the digital archiving as you as you say not just in question of access but um in question question of the, the my my, uh, my the, the summer that my talk could be summarized but in one sentence the devil is in the the devil is in the transcript um because transcription is um really you can record but if you want to if you want to you know then bring it you know if you want to bring it into access um you have to digitize it in some way and then preserve it in in a format that it then becomes accessible and possibly you know can be written down so that you know people can access it in other forms and just uh listening um but can you know read it uh, download it and, and various things, uh, and then process it uh, uh, in different manner. And uh, um, if those transcripts themselves are not um, done faithfully, um, or if or if some kind of, um, if you will, if you will, uh, I call it text 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 porosis occurs that have previously transcribed material suddenly becomes uh, faulty the stuff drops out and i discovered that in our experience then what have you got um so that's what that's one of the paranoid things i'm doing you know my my return to um leibniz and the baroque is not just passion a, a sort of a passional uh, uh process but also a paranoid process <laughs> i want to make sure i i got it right <laughs> you know yeah i feel the same way when i'm making videos you know i'm trying to i'm trying to build a pipeline that you know basically gets you know random people into this stuff and i want to make sure that i present it in the most accurate way possible and i'm aware of my own limitations i i try to do my best i work with my friends and try to cross all my t's but you know how it is <laughs> sure yeah you know you, you you can you find more t's to cross exactly yeah. all right so i'm gonna wrap up thank you for okay. so much for spending two hours talking today that's that, that yeah was, that's i had a i had a great conversation this was really insightful yeah, me too. 